right, everyone. I am on the line with Alana Fish. Alana is an assistant professor at the University of Alberta. Alana, welcome to the Twimble AI podcast. Yeah, cool. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Same. I'm really looking forward to our chat. Uh, I'd love to start by having you share a little bit about your background with our audience. How'd you come to work in kind of this intersection of computer science and psychology? Yeah, cool. So maybe I'll start way back um, when I was an undergrad. Uh, I was really interested in genetics. So I'll tell you about how I got into machine learning. I was really interested in genetics, um, and, but I was actually a computing science student. So I would take genetics classes for fun and also computing science for fun. Um, and then one day I came across this book that told me that you could use computer science to do genetics. And I was like blown away. It was the most <laughs> awesome thing. And I found a research group at the university. I actually did my undergrad at the University of Alberta. I did a, found a research group at the University of Alberta and started working with them. And uh, then I found out that you could actually uh, build non-deterministic programs with computers. I, had, I actually had never occurred to me that you could like build a computer program that you didn't know what it would do because part of the programming comes from data. And that was like also mind blowing. Uh, so I was just really excited about machine learning at that point. Um, and I went off to do actually to work at Google for a few years, um, which was a lot of fun. And I learned a lot, uh, but I felt like it wasn't quite as intellectually stimulating as I wanted it to be. So I went back to grad school um, and I joined Carnegie Mellon, which was an, it was an amazing place to be. Uh, and I worked with Tom Mitchell, and he at the time had a, he still does have a research group working on brain imaging and comparing brain imaging uh, to computer models of language. So we take brain images while people read, and we look at um, the representations we can detect with brain imaging and compare them to computer models of language. And there's lots of neat things you can discover when you start to compare those things together. So that was sort uh -huh. of the, the beginning, yeah. Awesome. Also, I suspect we'll be talking about the these brain images and some of the results that uh, come out of your work uh, with them in quite a bit. So maybe it might make sense to kind of dig into, you know, what the imaging process is and you know what the images look like, those kinds of things. Sure, that's a good idea. Yeah. So um, typically, we would have somebody come into. There's multiple ways you could do brain imaging. So fMRI, uh, EEG, or MEG. Um, but each one of those is just a, big, a machine that we you go into a room and we put it on your head and it captures some aspect of the, the brain's response to whatever you're looking at, whatever you're hearing. Uh, so sometimes we have people read, sometimes we have people listen to text uh, and their, your brain responds as you do those tasks. Uh, and just like a neural network creates representations as it's doing whatever task it's doing, has some input, does some computation and there's some sort of midpoints in those computation that we call hidden representations. Uh, the brain does the same thing. It has its input and it's doing some sort of computation and we can detect those midpoints of the computation um, with brain imaging. And so the, the big sort of discovery for, out of Tom Mitchell's lab, uh, you know, a little over a decade ago now was that there is a relationship between the representations uh, that we build in single word uh, models of language and the brain's representations to single words in isolation. Uh, and so from there, it's been expanded to, you know, the LSTMs and transformers that you probably talk about on your on your podcast and also to computer models of vision. When people look at images, the representations that their brains make, those intermediate representations actually map onto convolutional neural networks really well, which I think is a neat, uh, a neat sort of fact. When you talk about the the representations that the the brain makes, what is what does that mean? What does that look like? Are we talking about, um, you know, pixels or points in a 3D, you know, whatever the, the image scan format is, or is there some higher level representation that is created kind of based on the knowing the structure of the brain? Yeah, so it depends on the modality. So if you're doing fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, then you would actually get a 3D volume of the brain. So it's like a 3D picture, and we call each one of the pixels in that picture a voxel because it's a volumetric pixel. And those voxels represent sort of the, the change in blood oxygen as your brain is doing work. And so different parts of your brain as you're doing different tasks will do different amounts of work. Um, and we, so it's sort of like a byproduct of the work your brain is doing we can detect with fMRI. So we can see which parts of your brain are working more or less depending on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, it's sort of, it's a slow moving signal. So fMRI, we get about 
uh, one sample every one to two seconds. And it takes actually about six seconds for your brain to have its peak response to a stimuli. So if I show you a picture, I actually need to look at your fMRI image six seconds later to see sort of the peak response to your, your that image. Uh, EEG, or electroencephalography, is a different kind of brain imaging that um, gives me a time series uh, from different sensor locations I put on your scalp. So I put a bunch of sensors over your scalp, and then I read it from those sensors as I show you um, uh, images or, or have you read. And the sensors um, have much better time resolution than fMRI. So instantaneously, as soon as your brain uh, reacts to something, EEG rec uh, recognizes the electrical field caused by neurons firing. Uh, and so it's very good time resolution, but EEG has worse spatial resolution than fMRI. So it's sort of like a trade-off. But if we're talking mm -hmm. about fMRI, we're talking about voxels. And if we're talking about EEG, it's like a whole bunch of time series uh, sensor readings that come out. And so it's um, with fMRI, we have a bit more of the anatomical uh, characteristics of the brain that are visible. But um, with EEG, it's, it's more of a general area of the brain that we think the signal is coming from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then kind of circling back to that question, when you, the, the, the representation is just the data coming out of the sensors or is there some higher level, um, you know, thing that comes out of the processing of those signals that you call the representation? No, we actually, so the, some of the simplest models are just straight up regression models with the, the data that comes out of the EEG, for example. Okay. Uh, it's not anything complicated. So it really is, there is a linear relationship between what we can capture with fMRI and EEG and uh, computer models of language of representations that they create. Awesome. So it's nothing, you know, magic or complicated. It's a pretty straightforward uh, mapping. Nice. And so um, you kind of talk about your research broadly as, um, you know, studying the brain to better understand machine learning and studying machine learning to better understand the brain. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the relationship between those two worlds and, you know, how you've seen it evolve over the years. Sure. Yeah. So uh, Tom's research focused mainly on adults um, uh, and fluent adults. And so I think there's actually a, a lot of directions that you can go when you take that as your starting off point. You can um, remove the fluency component. So like what happens if we start to do these experiments where we have people um, experiencing a language that they don't know at all, so they're learning a new language on the fly? Um, what do the representations look like? Uh, can we see the representations of their native language showing up as they learn that a new word maps onto their, a word in their native language? Uh, so we did an experiment with uh, some of my colleagues at the University of Victoria, where we showed that people um, can, uh, as they're doing a language learning task with an EEG, us recording EEG, we can actually tell that they are learning the meanings of the words and they are actually calling up the English, for this case it was English, the English meanings of the words when they see these symbols in, in, in a new language. So on the mm -hmm. fly, we can see these representations showing up. So you can move to, you can remove the fluency component. You could also say, uh, instead of studying adults, let's try uh, in children or infants. And that's something I'm also working on now. Uh, although it's unpublished, you know, looking for the similar sorts of uh, word representations in the infant brain. Um, even before infants can talk, we can see, uh, we have evidence that they understand language. And so can we see the representations also? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's sort of how we use um, computer models of language to understand the brain. So they allow us to see uh, word representation um, in cases where it was not totally clear you'd be able to see it. So for example, in word, in, in language learning and in infants. Um, and then how can computer models, how can the brain improve computer models, I think is actually um, a really interesting future direction. Um, if we think of uh, the brain uh, as producing these intermediate representations along its way, along the computational route that it has to do, for example, when it, when it sees an image. So you see an image, you do something with your brain, and you get to the point where you understand what's in the image. And what we yeah. can measure with something like fMRI, EEG, are those intermediate stages along the way from the input to the understanding. So we can, we can understand those, so we can see those representations using brain imaging. And uh, can we use those representations to improve computer models of vision, for example? Mm -hmm. So those are sort of the two directions. Okay. Um, 
it seems like the the six second time lag on fmri would be a big inhibitor to the kinds of things i'm hearing you do with that that data is it um is it a linear time lag like it's it, you know, it's just not real time. It's just six seconds behind. But, you know, otherwise from, you know, point to point, they're true representations of what happened about six seconds ago. Or uh, does it get more complicated than that? So often we like, um, well, so there's a couple ways you can handle that. One is that you can show people a word, uh, give like a good lag in between the words you show people. So if you give a good lag in between the words you show people, then you sort of solve start part of that problem. But natural language comes at you uh, around two words a second. And mm -hmm. so what are you going to do if you're, we call them a, a volume, one of your fMRI images is uh, two seconds of data um, from six seconds ago, what are you going to do? It's going to contain four words. And so, you know, there's lots of ways you can handle it, but one way is to just um, treat it as if all four of those words are, are happening at the same time during that, that time segment. Okay. Uh, yeah. And that's often what, what people do. Uh, but it's, it's a downfall of fMRI, but it's also, I mean, you get the spatial resolution with fMRI, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, so you provide a little bit, a little bit of an overview of using uh, models to kind of detect, identify word uh, meaning in a couple of different scenarios. Um, you know, tell us a little bit more about the, the, you know, the models that we're talking about and, um, you know, how they're applied. For the task where we were looking at uh, word meaning as you're learning words, we actually just use word to vec, which at this point is a little bit of an old model, but it's, you know, a tried and true. Um, so it's just word to vec, so a, a neural network that's trained to predict context words given a central word. So if I tell you the, the central word of a sentence, I want you to tell me uh, the probability of seeing uh, particular words nearby. Uh, mm -hmm. So the hidden representations of a neural network learned, uh, trained to do that task uh, actually correlate well to, that we knew, correlated well to adults uh, who are fluent in a language. And so the question was, can we do the same thing for adults as they're learning a new language? Um, and then the, the, the method for going from that representation uh, to the brain is actually just uh, like a simple ridge regression. So it's like a regularized linear regression. Uh, it's actually, you know, a really simple technique. And so what are your, your labels in the case of you've got the, basically your signals, your sensor readings, uh, and you are um, trying to predict the word. Mm -hmm. well, you know, the word that's spoken and the sensor reading. So those are your features and your labels. Right. And the, how are you using the word to back the embeddings? Yeah. So you could do it in two ways, but I usually, uh, the input to the regression model would be, for example, an EEG recording. And mm -hmm. we would train an independent regression model to predict each one of the dimensions of the word to back vector. So like 300 independent regression models predicting the 300 dimensions of the word to back vector. Okay. And so now I have a predicted vector a predicted word vector for an EEG image. And I also know the true uh, word vector. And so from there, we can do something like calculating the correlation um, or we can rank all of the words that we know will be, uh, could be uh, shown and then see where the true word is ranked in, a you know, when the list is ranked with respect to the predicted vector, distance to the predicted vector. So sort of like how good is our prediction to the true word vector is the thing we're yeah. making. And so we can get like fairly good accuracy uh, on that. It sort of depends on the uh, multiple factors, but um, you know, depending on the experiments, EEG, we found the accuracies to be a little lower, but around 60% um, sort of rank accuracy, you would say. So like where in a list would this particular item show up if we ranked um, all of the possible words, we'd see it around 60% uh, from the bottom, you know, so it would be, uh, 50 would be at like chance. And so it's like slightly above chance EEG. We found to be a little bit more noisy than something like, uh, fMRI or MEG, which is a sort of a better EEG. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you also mentioned that you've done similar experiments where you're incorporating vision into the mix. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about that one. Yeah. So there, uh, just like we had seen that there are correlations between, uh, computer models of language and the brain while it reads. Uh, there had been uh, 
studies showing that there are correlations between the brain looking at images and computer models of vision. Uh, so this had been shown originally in monkeys, uh, so direct neural recordings from monkeys, and then but then later shown in uh, humans uh, using fMRI. They showed that if you show, for example, an image from ImageNet, uh, and look at the representations, the different um, sort of voxel readings you get out of the human brain at different visual areas of the brain. Uh, you can correlate those to the different layers of a neural network. And uh, the one I'm thinking of, I think they used AlexNet, which is like a, a eight layer neural network, uh, CNN. And they found that sort of as you move up through that hierarchy from input to prediction in the CNN, you get uh, um, representations that correlate uh, to the visual hierarchy in the in the visual system, the visual system also has sort of input, and then a hierarchy of, of areas that sort of uh, read in from previous areas, just like the just like a CNN. So the lower uh, areas of the visual system correlate well to the lower layers, the layers closer to the input in a CNN. And as we move up through the visual system, we actually uh, we find representations that correlate better to uh, hidden representations in the CNN that are closer to the prediction layer. So sort of like this, this computation that starts from uh, images, either on the retina or in an actual computer image, um, and then moves forward to do some sort of task, like in the brain or like in the CNN, those representations, that computation is actually, has a relationship, right? Like there's, even though like the CNN doesn't know anything about how the brain does vision, it, it has some inspiration from the brain, but it doesn't know anything about the brain. It actually creates right. these representations that have a relationship to the brain's representation. So that, I mean, in itself was a, a bit of a magical moment. Um, and so we took that and, and tried to flip it on its head. We said, so when we are done training a computer vision model, the representations that it learns are more like uh, a human brain than not. So it's similar to a human brain after it's done training. So what does it mean? What would it mean if we said, if we took some representations of, um, in this case, it was actually monkeys viewing images. If we took those representations and used them to constrain the CNN. So if we take, if we say to the CNN, um, after you're done training, you would have a representation that looks like this. You should have a representation that looks like this. And so while we're training, we're trying to get the representations to look like what we observe in the brain. So we just, uh, we just incorporate a new part of the loss function that says the representations should um, sort of create a space such that it uh, looks like the brain. And so the way we did that is yeah. if you take two images and pass them to the CNN, you'll get two representations, hidden representations, and you can mm -hmm. compare the distance between those representations. So if they were two pictures of cats, those representations would be sim pretty similar. If there's a represent if it's a picture of a house and a picture of cat, they'd be more different. Right. And the, the same thing you would expect to be true in the in the monkey brain. So if they see a cat or they see a house, they have different representations uh, and they have different uh, patterns of similarity. And so what we are doing is um, introducing a constraint that says uh, the space that you're learning, the hidden representations that the convolutional neural net is learning should respect those, those distance patterns. So you should, you should learn a representation for images of cats that are sort more similar to other images of cats than they are to images of houses. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, sort of learn to to create a space that um, respects those distance patterns that we see in the brain. So when we did that, uh, we saw a, a small uh, but consistent improvement in performance on object recognition in CNNs. Um, and we saw it across several different CNN architectures. Um, it, we, and it, it trains a little bit faster. Uh, but I think maybe one of the more interesting uh, findings was that we also found that the mistakes that the CNN made, so it makes fewer mistakes when it has this additional brain constraint. The accuracy is better, it makes fewer uh, mistakes, but it also makes better mistakes in that the the mistakes that it makes, if it says, um, oh, this isn't a cat. Well, what is the mistake that it makes? It's going to be more likely to be within the same class of, of object. So it's less likely going to confuse a cat with a house than a cat with a dog. So it's, mm. its mistakes are, are better. Its mistakes are less bad. Um, so they're more often within the super class, the same super class. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So and, and so some of the interesting stuff for that is, first of all, it's monkeys. So monkeys don't actually know really have the same conceptual, conceptualizations of cats and houses that we do, right? right. And furthermore, the, the data we used was actually from anesthetized monkeys. So these monkeys were actually not even conscious at the time of the data recording. Uh, so mm. I think there's, 
that's a it was a, a sort of a proof of concept and i think there's there's tons more work to do there and then we're collecting brain imaging data to do that now because really we should be using awake humans to do the data collection not right. right. uh i don't know that makes me think about the um the kind of work that's going into like adversarial attacks and if this kind of right thing, yeah can we it um, like the the headline is like using human intelligence to help networks you know avoid adversarial attacks. Absolutely, that was something. I, so we didn't actually look at that from my recollection in that paper, but that was absolutely something that was on our radar. So like, does it train better? Is it more robust to adversarial attacks? Mm-hmm. Um, and so before we started this interview, we were saying sort of like, well, we've been studying neural networks for a long time without really considering how the brain works, and that's true. But when we come up against these weird things like adversarial attacks, I think. Um, those are the sorts of places where it might make sense to try to think about, uh, try to use brain imaging to improve networks. So yeah. can we use them to be a little uh, more robust to adversarial attacks? Can we use them to, um, to do it's what we call the long tail, right? Like, so you could get a really long way in machine learning without, uh, without actually you can get a really long way with just rule-based systems. Right. Mm-hmm. But when we start to get into the more sort of edge case things, then it starts to get harder and harder. And you have to look a little further, uh, further out to, to get the improvements, to get all the way to say a hundred percent. And now what you were just describing was you created a, a, neur- a neural network for object detection that's kind of conditioned on stuff that we know about the brain. Um, I thought you said earlier, either before we started recording or since that independent of that kind of conditioning, you also find correlations between the spaces that, uh, uh, you know, again, an unconditioned vision network will create and what you would see in a human. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, un- right, without, without knowing anything about the human brain, the, the computer vision model creates representations that, that correlate to the human brains. But the question is, well, they're not perfect correlations, right? And so is that extra little bit of, uh, push enough to improve accuracy we saw the answer was yes um, and enough to sort of improve it in these other ways like against uh, make better mistakes for example and you've also been looking at the relationship between uh, the computer vision models uh, and the representations that they create and the and language models um, and the representations that uh, that those models create can you talk a little bit about that work Right. Yeah. So we had talked so far about how language models correlate to the brain and computer vision models correlate to the brain. So then the next obvious question is, well, what about language models and computer vision models, right? Uh They can create representations. How could we compare them? This is actually a fun uh, paper because it it was born out of a a miscommunication between my student and I. So I asked him to do what in retrospect was a very boring thing. And I won't even tell you what it was. <laughs> and he came back to me with this result. And I was like, that's not what we talked about. But wait a second, that worked. <laughs> so he, I had asked him to do something boring. But what he did instead was correlated the um, representations from uh, word to Beck with uh, the layers of a neural network. And so we actually did like VGG16, ResNet, uh, Inception uh, V3 or whatever, something like mm-hmm. that. Um, so we looked at the hidden representations that are made uh, through the processing of all of those networks, and we compared them to word to vec uh, representations. So word to, word to vec is not a deep network; it only creates one hidden representation per word. Uh, but it, uh, the as you move from input to prediction in in several different neural networks, you actually see uh, movement towards uh, representations that look like word to vec. And when I say word look like, again, it's this idea that um, if I show a cat and a house to a neural network and I look at the representations, the distance between the representations um, becomes more similar as we move up through the network to the distances that we see in word to vec So word to vec knows that dogs and cats are very similar, but dogs and trucks are different. And mm-hmm. we see that the representations follow a similar pattern and that pattern gets stronger as we move through the neural network. So es- essentially neural networks are learning semantics the sorts of semantics we observe in language, even though neural networks know nothing about language, right? Sorry, mm-hmm. convolutional neural networks know nothing about language. They only understand concepts and they understand concepts in a discrete way, right? Like they actually don't know that dogs and cats have anything to do with each other, uh, but they yeah. do know that dogs and cats show up in images that look similar, right? Like 
dogs and cats, yeah. often yeah. seen sitting on laps, often seen with leashes and such like this. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. You, uh, I guess when you mentioned this before, I said that I couldn't decide whether, <laughs> you know, this was astounding or the, kind of what I would expect. And I'm still in the same place with regard to this result. Um, so let me, let, let me just drive that home then. Cause I, so words of X trained on text, right. trained to predict context right. words. I know I've already said this to you, but let me say it to, to your audience too. <laughs> trained on context words, <laughs> trained to predict context words from a central word, uh, only understands words as discrete units and then learns representations to cluster them properly. Convolutional yep. neural networks take pixels as input and produce like discrete labels for those images and like trained on completely different data sets, completely different architectures. Yeah show up with the same representations and why you're right it's it makes sense because why words the Underline words we're using objects it, right. Are, right there's, it's a, there's yeah. some representation in the world in theory in the matrix yes and both of these are like smaller representations of the representation in the matrix i guess right exactly so if there is some true semantic model that exists out in the world right um that's what we're measuring when we measure when we use language and when we use images yeah yeah yeah. I don't know. So I think it's sense, awesome. It's still incredible. <laughs> yeah. I think it's awesome. And it's also, if you think of it, so we also saw that it's not like a linear trend. It's not like it goes continuously up as we go through a neural network, but rather there's sort of ups and downs. And um, mm -hmm. in particular, some of the, like a ResNet has those residual connections. And we saw that uh, it seemed like in some cases, some of the residual connections didn't seem to be, like the, the residual connections seemed to be the place where most of the information was uh, coming from and so maybe the stuff that was happening in, inside of the residual block i think it's called seemed mm -hmm. maybe to not be adding anything and so you could see it being used in a way to improve convolutional neural networks like is this the right architecture choice to make maybe we should look at how it relates to computer models of language because you know mm. conceptually we should all be heading towards the same direction and if we're seeing that parts of our network don't seem to be getting us towards that same representation maybe it's not the right architectural choice Right. That's an idea of not something we've actually explored, but right. Uh, I think what I'm hearing in that is, you know, if we've established that, you know, these representations are related, uh, then, you know, when we're designing vision networks, we can, you know, think of, you know, the, the reference, uh, we can think of the representations from the language networks as a kind of reference or the representation from the brain, you know, right. as, as a reference and uh, kind of constrain the things that the network is doing uh, to be improving relative to this reference. And we talked about that in the, the other research that you did. You've right. already yeah. kind of demonstrated some aspect of that. Right. Uh, but this would be, you know, how do we use it to uh, enhance architecture, for example? Right. Yes. And so that when I talked about the iClear workshop this year was um, you can think of what we measure with fMRI as these artifacts of the algorithm. The brain is doing something. We don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but we can measure the points along that algorithm. You can think of it as being able to see the ticker tape in a Turing machine. So I can read the state of the computer. I don't know what the computer is doing, but I can read something about the internal state as it's doing it. Um, and then I can use those sort of internal state measurements to improve another model that I'm trying to build that should be doing the same thing. So it's sort of, it releases you from this constraint that like, I need to understand what the brain is doing in order to pr improve machine learning models. I actually, that's not true. And I've shown it's not true. We don't need to know what the brain is doing because we can measure these artifacts of the algorithm and use those artifacts to constrain our, our, our algorithm, our model that is learning its own algorithm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one question that comes up for me and all this is um you know how how far do you take your interpretation of these results um you know does you know you know, clearly we're not saying that the representation of the you know the the neural network is like fundamentally the same as the representation of the brain or something like that um Although, you know, maybe there's something attractive to you. Know, you kind of want to be able to say something like that, but it's probably not true. And I, I guess I'm curious, you know, as you engage with results like this, you know, how it's impacted your kind of mental model of 
like the brain and like, you know, do you kind of, you know, there, you know, lines that you draw in interpreting results like this? Like, how do you think about it all? Well, so I, we definitely have to uh, take a step back and consider that, of course, the brain is not, when you talk about the, the CNN model that's doing object recognition, like when a person looks at an image, they're doing so much more than object recognition, right? right? So there's a ton of other stuff going on in the brain. And, you know, during language understanding, you're doing also all sorts of other stuff that a neural network is just not doing. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's, there's always that caveat. And until we have, you know, computer models that are doing multiple tasks, like, on the sort of scope that a human can do, I, I think we will we will be very far from uh, creating representations that are completely uh, coherent to the human brain. Um, and then, of course, different people have different. I mean, different people have different experiences of the world, and of course, everybody's representation is a little bit different. So you just mentioned that um, you kind of mentioned that you know the the brain is doing lots of things. Um, you've also done some work that kind of relates, uh, language models to the various tasks that we have been trying to use language models for, uh, can you talk a little bit about that work? I guess it's sort of like a moving forward. One of my inspirations is that the, the brain is doing lots of stuff, especially as you're reading and it's doing more than what we're currently training our, well, that many language models are trained to do. So language models often predict the next word in a sequence or predict a masked word in a sentence. Um, people are doing much more than that while they're uh, reading. Um, and so I, I'm at the University of Alberta now, which is a great place to be for reinforcement learning. And I think if we think at a bigger level about what people are doing while they, um, while they do language, they have multiple sort of layers of uh, tasks. So they have like, they do have a task of, of generating the next word in a sequence, right? But it's not the only thing they're doing. They have sort of these layers of, of uh, rewards, right? And that's, uh, can be similar to what reinforcement uh, models uh, do. Um, and so one thing we had tried was, uh, can we, uh, in a multitask sort of a way, multitask learning has been shown to create better representations uh, and p- produce models that are more accurate. And so we, we use sort of a multitask framework, except we use uh, reinforcement learning um, to it constrain the, the representations and showed that the um, if we constrain the representations to predict not only in the next word, but also the part of speech of the next word, it actually ended up working better. And so that was a very simple example of um, uh, sort of incorporating an additional piece of prediction into a neural network uh, in order to uh, improve the sort of language generation process. Uh, but in the future, I'd like to... Um, do the same sort of thing with common sense reasoning. So can we um, incorporate into a model the idea of common sense reasoning using a reinforcement framework, a reinforcement learning framework uh, to improve language generation and, and to think about the task of language generation, not just as the next word, but rather at a higher level. Mm-hmm. And can you talk a little bit about the setup for those problems from a, a RL perspective? Uh, uh, yeah, so really it was just that we replaced the the loss function with TD error. And so TD error has the nice benefit of having uh, sort of rolling uh, in uh, information from the future back into previous predictions. Um, and so it was just sort of that, that idea that we could use information, um, like future information to sort of update into the current representation in a different way than, uh, of course, the, like, Rack propagation through time also does a similar thing, but it was sort of a, it's a different way to incorporate that information. It ended up working better than uh, just plain old least squares back propagation through time. Mm-hmm. And is reinforcement learning used in this case to train kind of from train the language model from ground up, or is it used to supplement an existing? trained language model that's kind of traditionally trained using unsupervised learning or, uh, you know, whatever. So we trained from scratch and it was used alongside the typical, uh, like LSTM predicting the next word in a sequence. Okay. So at the same time as the LSTM is learning to predict the next word in the sequence, we constrain one of the hidden representations to also be useful for predicting the part of speech of the next word in the sequence. So you can sort of think of that, like if I was able to predict the part of speech of the next word, that would mean that my the normal task for a language model, which is choose one of the of 10,000 words 
for the next word. That's a hard prediction task. But if you could, if you had instead information about the part of speech for the next word, um, that part of speech information could narrow down that you know prediction space from ten thousand to you know in some cases like twenty words, depending on the the word category. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a big improvement in the the prediction space, um, and you know also incorporating the prediction from that uh, that model. So it was another piece of, that we worked on was. Um, so not just constraining the representation, but then also incorporating the prediction itself back into the representation, the hidden representation in the next layer, um, makes it more uh, available for future predictions. So actually taking that label, what is the next part of speech in the, in the sequence, putting that label in the hidden representation in the next layer, and then using it for prediction of the next word, uh, we saw an improvement. And what are some other things that you might want to explore along the same lines? Uh, so we're, we're interested in incorporating uh, common sense reasoning into uh, language generation. So um, it has some work showing that uh, even though, um, so like there's this data set called LAMA that is some, has some um, sentences in, uh, with true or false um, sort of uh, finishings, like the last word is either makes a sentence true or false. And we found that even when the... Um, when the sort of prediction of the network was to create a false sentence, it, we could tell with above chance accuracy that from the representation that sort of it had a, it had a sort of a, what's the word? A, a hint that it knew it was going to make a mistake. It knew that the sentence was false. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, this sort of brings to mind the idea of metacognition that you have some m monitoring process that's running at the same time as your, um, you're online, like as I'm generating my language to you, I'm also monitoring my language and making sure I'm not making mistakes as I talk. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes it's working and sometimes it's not. Um, uh, but sort of a similar thing you could think of for BERT. So I guess, it, so in the representation, there's a signal that it knows it's wrong. And so could we create um, a sort of additional piece of, an additional prediction piece that its only job is to tell whether or not the prediction it's going to make is correct or not. So there's part of the network that's predicting the next word. And then there's this little offshoot. All it's trying to do is say whether or not the prediction is going to be right or wrong. And um, using the hidden representation before the prediction layer is actually better than just using the entropy at the prediction layer. So it's sort of like additional information that you can't just get from the probabilities of the prediction itself. You are able to tell that it, it is actually kind of aware that it's going to make this mistake. So there's actually previous work in computer vision showing that this sort of self-monitoring, am I about to make a mistake, actually can improve. Uh, model training. And so it's something else we're trying to incorporate into language models. If you have sort of like this self-monitoring loop that's um, not trying to do the prediction, but it's just trying to tell if the prediction is going to be right, um, can we do, uh, can we improve model uh, model generation? Nice, nice. Uh, and then more broadly, what are some of the directions that you see kind of taking your, your research, you know, across the board, given some of the projects that we've talked about? Yeah, so I'm really, I am really interested in studying uh, language development. So I have some amazing collaborators um, who study uh, infant uh, language representation in infants. Uh, so I would like to be able to study how uh, language representations change as you acquire more words. So I talked about learning a new language uh, for adults. That's different than le like learning your first language. Yeah. And understanding meaning in the world as you uh, incorporate new words. I, I think it would be really interesting to study that and study how the semantic space uh, shifts and changes over the developmental sort of lifespan. So as an infant, you have us an understanding of the world. And then sort of as you learn to walk and talk, that, that understanding changes. Uh, as you, you know, as you learn to read, the understanding changes again. Um, can we sort of see those change points in uh, the developmental, rep the representations as they develop? And also then, uh, you know, bigger picture, can we use sort of how the brain does that updating process to improve computer models of language? Because as you know, like children learn language at a rate that is way faster than our current neural network models. And so, Maybe there's something there. Maybe we can figure out how it's doing that space reorganization in a more effective way uh, so that computer models can do it. But awesome. that's, that's, big, that's big picture blue sky. That, that's something I'm excited about. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Alana, thanks so much for taking the time to share with us a bit about your research and what you're up to. Yeah, great. Thanks so much for having me. Great. Thank you.